the time to start. Time to start. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Leonard Benschop. I'm uh, a Linux user almost since the earliest days. And uh, at the moment, I work at Authentic in Vught, a company that uh, creates uh, fingerprint sensors and security hardware. And in Vught, we design uh, hardware devices for uh, cryptography, like uh, IPsec acceleration, uh, SSL acceleration, public key, private key, uh, symmetric key algorithms, um, and also the associated software drivers, um, what have you. Uh, I don't use core boot at my uh, job. <coughs> It's just, uh, but I did uh, use some lo do I do uh, I do uh, some low-level programming device drivers. I did some early some startup code uh, for ARM systems. Uh, so low-level programming is one of the things I really do at Authentic sometimes. But move on to core boot, the real. Th Thing. Now, an overview of my presentation. First, a short introduction. Then, why should we use Core Boot? Then, I'll discuss the architecture of Core Boot. Uh, then, the practical matters. Uh, how to start development. How to test Core Boot. How to put it into your motherboard. And then, I'll... Uh, give a short de demo with, uh <coughs> with a simulated system running core boot. So you get some idea of how it, what it looks like. Um, so what is core boot? It's free firmware for the x86 architecture, a, a BIOS replacement. And well, without firmware in ROM, no modern computer would start. It's as simple as that. When, when computers still had core memory and f front panel switches in, in the good old days, you could buy a computer without any firmware installed and just start uh, poking the bootloader bit by bit into uh, core memory and then flick the run switch and off it went. Now, those days are gone. And the x86 is architecture, the PC architecture, is fairly complicated to start, to, to, to initialize the hardware for, compared to other systems. Um, when was the project started? Already 12 years ago, uh, and then it was still called Linux BIOS. Uh, at Les Alamos, uh, National Laboratory, they had a large cluster of PCs, all running Linux, and, well, kind of like a supercomputer composed of many PCs, a cluster. And what was the problem? When you switched those PCs on, and they had no keyboard, and why would you want to have 100 keyboards in, in a rack of uh, 100 PCs, that's silly. Uh, but if they had no keyboard, they said, uh, keyboard error, press F1 to continue. <laughs> and <coughs> that's not ideal for a cluster. So they started to implement their own firmware, and the goal was to put a the Linux kernel directly into ROM and start it as soon as the hardware was sufficiently initialized to get things going. Um, why would you want to use Coreboot? Now, there are several application areas uh, where you would, would want to use Coreboot. Uh, embedded systems, of course, 
x86 architecture is far from market leader in embedded systems, but it uh, still has some application areas. Uh, Rack-mounted servers, uh, clusters, large racks full of PC motherboards, without keyboards, without monitors. Uh, and then it has some advantages to use it even on on regular PCs. Um, embedded 86 applications. Um, well, you have those media centers, uh, PVRs, personal video recorders, uh, smart TVs, TVs with web browsers built in. And at least some of these uh, contain uh, something that looks like a PC motherboard. Um, then you have test and measurement uh, equipment, logic analyzers, network protocol an uh, analyzers. We at, at Authentic have a network protocol analyzer. Uh, and, well, when you switch it on, it boots Windows. It, it's not even hidden that there's a PC inside. And it's basically a PC with some uh, really expensive hardware attached and some expensive software running on it. And that analyzes uh, and, and can do speed tests of, of routers and, and see what the maximum throughput is. <coughs> and do some uh, protocol validation if it really uh, conforms to, to, to the protocols when, when routing packets. Um, you have in industrial control, uh, the big machines in factories, that, uh, some of which are controlled by PCs, some by uh, networks of PLCs or small embedded systems, and then which this network is supervised by a PC. Uh, you have uh, applications that are uh, accessed by the general public. Uh, ticket vending machines, when you, when you go into the station and buy a train ticket, or voting machines, you don't want this, voting via a PC, but at least some voting machines in some countries use PC hardware. And photo kiosks, you, you put your f SD card from your camera in, in, in that machine, and then you select the photos that you want to have printed, and then you pay a lot of money to get those photos printed. Uh, but this, this type of equipment, and you don't want to some guy to stick a USB stick into the USB slot of this photo kiosk and then uh, cut the power for a short time and then boot his own operating system on this uh, thing. <coughs> Um, but, but why do we want to use it? Well, there's of course the royalty payment, but honestly this, this only pays off when you, buy, uh, when you are making huge series. If you buy off-the-shelf motherboards, you get BIOS already on them. Uh, you don't get discounts for not having BIOS on them. But if you're developing your own board, it, it could save those costs. Uh, fast booting, now that's an advantage. If you switch on your TV or your uh, setup box and it just says, uh, just starts working in, in three seconds instead of booting, 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 two minutes later, it starts responding to your remote control. Uh, reliable unintended booting, that is the photo kiosk scenario. Uh, you don't want uh, someone to, to put a USB stick inside uh, this machine and, and boot Ubuntu on it. Well, it's great for hack value, but not for the operator of the Photoshop. <coughs> Um, servers and clusters, then, of course, reliable unattended booting is uh, the main uh, unique selling point for it. Uh, 
Well, of course, we don't want keyboards on those machines. Uh, no monitors. Uh, you don't want one of these machines in your cluster uh, with a corrupted uh, CMOS RAM to start booting from floppy again, which it doesn't have. Or ask for a keyboard, which it doesn't have. Uh, so if you configure core boot to just boot the way you want to boot this always to boot this cluster, <coughs> regardless of what's in the CMOS or is not in the CMOS RAM, then your machine boots reliably. Uh, you want to, to have close control, uh, only network booting, only booting from this disk and no others. You get this control with core boot. Um, <coughs> you can boot a machine without any local disk storage. Uh, and of course, PEXI booting exists on mo most machines today. Uh, but it's a fairly restricted uh, way to do network booting. And with core boot, you could do more. <coughs> Why for normal PCs? Now, well, one thing is because we can. Uh, it's technically challenging. And anything that's technically challenging uh, has some geek appeal. Um, then there's the, the, the advantage if, if you buy a motherboard, you can sometimes get uh, an update for BIOS with some bug fixes. But if the motherboard is two years old, forget it. And some bugs will never be fixed. If you buy a motherboard with lousy uh, USB booting, it will stay that way probably. And if you run C BIOS on a core boot, new versions get better and better at, uh, and you get those benefits. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, stay in control of your own hardware. Who has heard about secure boot? Well, secure boot is great as long as you control the keys. And you want to be in control somehow and stay in control. And you want to have the option to, to use firmware that has secure boot or use firmware that doesn't have it. Uh, now, now we're getting technical to the architecture. Always from the start, uh, Core boot was split into core boot restricted itself, core boot itself restricted itself to do the minimal hardware initialization to get the PC in, in a state where, say, a Linux kernel could start running. And, and that, that, that's a long way between uh, power up and having all your RAM chips uh, functional, having all your PCI buses configured correctly, uh, and to have a chance to, uh, to run Linux. And, but Corbo ju did just that. So no fancy setup screens, uh, no user visible APIs, just start the payload and run it. Uh, <coughs> now, the payload is what gets started after core boot proper has done its uh, thing. Uh, and there are several types of uh, payload. Uh, you have C BIOS. Well, you're getting your old fashioned, stupid uh, PC BIOS functionality so you can boot anything under the sun. Uh, I don't like uh, DOS, Windows, free, open, uh, NetBSD, uh, and of course, uh, all standard Linux boot disks. 
you can use a Linux kernel directly as a payload with a small root file system, possibly con containing your application or containing uh, the script to download the real production kernel from a network and get that started. Uh, that's probably uh, for good for cluster environment. Uh, so instead of uh, having some Pexy boot ROM with just boot p tftp, you can boot a Linux kernel from ROM, which has uh, HTTP support, uh, wget, uh, iSCSI, uh, anything you want. SSL, uh, if if you want that, and it can download the kernel and, and all startup parameters from some boot server in your cluster. You can make it as fancy as you like. And then KXX starts the real kernel and, and gets your cluster node booted exactly the way you want it. Uh, of course, there are dedicated bootloader payloads for um, for uh, core boot, like Philo, it's, it's a kind of Grub, but slightly different. Grub itself can, Grub tool can uh, itself can be used as a core boot payload. Uh, well, applications that are some tiny games like uh, Tint, which isn't Tetris but looks like it, S somewhat uh, Grub Invaders. Uh, but of course, um, memory diagnostic tools, that things that are actually useful. Uh, if you want a traditional PC BIOS setup screen, uh, well, that can be a core boot payload too, no problem. Uh, and of course, the next big thing for PC BIOS will be UEFI, the, the extensible firmware interface which got unified somewhere along the way. So, so this U got added. And Tiano Core is an open source implementation of this uh, standard. Only problem is it doesn't do hardware initialization. That's what Coreboot Core do, does. So it hasn't been integrated uh, as a payload, but it shouldn't be too Hard, it should be doable. So, core boot with EFI is an option, will be an option in the future. Um, so, <coughs> that is so much about payloads. What does core boot do? Um, well, it's, it's composed of uh, three parts, actually. It's the boot block. Uh, at the very bottom line, the assembly part of uh, the ROM stage. The boot block is at a fixed location in ROM, and all it does is uh, switch to protected mode, enable some caches, uh, look for the ROM stage in the, which is an object in the CBFS, well, say file system but look for the, C the ROM stage object and start that. And then the other part is the ROM stage written in C, no more assembly language, and that, does the, uh, that uh, initializes the RAM chips. So when this machine comes up, it, it's, it can't access RAM. Uh, the, the, those RAM chips are, those controllers are, are not initialized. And that's the job of the, the ROM stage in C. And then there's the RAM stage that's downloaded from ROM into RAM. It's compressed in ROM, it's decompressed into RAM, it's executed into RAM. And then that thing does other hardware initialization, like uh, enumerating all those PCI buses or quasi-PCI buses like the internal uh, north and south bridge devices, a PCI Express, uh, AGP, if, if it's still, car uh, still used. Uh, 
Um, <coughs> so this this is this diagram. I, I hope it's a bit clear. But uh, on top, th this is uh, already a bit obsolete. But on top, there's the CPU. Via the front side bus, it's connected to the north bridge. The north bridge is responsible for interfacing with RAM, with the uh, RAM modules. Um, the south bridge is responsible for uh, PCI bus uh, and I.O. devices like uh, USB, SATA, and parallel ATA IDE drives, which we used to call them then. Um, then there's the Super I.O. chip, that's for the really slow things. The, the LPC bus, low pin count, it's what became of the ISA bus when the ISA the physical ISA slots were removed from the PC architecture in 2000. And, well, the, the soup, architecturally it's still ISA, the ISA bus, but it has fewer pins, physically it's not the same. Uh, the ROM chip, the BIOS chip, is somewhere on that bus. In some motherboards, there are others where it's connected to the south bus, South Bridge via uh, different interfaces like SPI. Uh, and Super IO chip contains uh, interfaces for floppy disks, nobody uses them anymore. Uh, PS2 keyboards, uh, they're still around. Serial, uh, parallel, well, serial is still useful. But I think most modern motherboards don't have Super I.O. chips anymore. <coughs> um, so, what's the startup sequence look like in Core Boot? Um, first, uh, the after reset, after hard reset, uh, the CPU executes from a fixed address. And that there's the startup code, uh, the fixed address in ROM. It's inside the boot block. And the first thing that Core Boot does is switch to protected mode. No more stupid 16-bit uh, segments, uh, segment offset calculation, all the things I have grown up when I had to program in, in DOS. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, and, and uh, when I had to program in DOS, MS-DOS, it, it was all 16-bit. Um, but Core Boot is almost entirely written in C and almost entirely uses 32-bit uh, linear addresses, like Linux does in kernel mode. Um, well, once uh, this the system has switched to protected mode. It initializes the caches. Remember, uh, the PC starts up without uh, and main memory working. Those RAM chips are hard to, to initialize, to correctly at least. So, uh, but the CPU itself contains RAM. It's called cache. And with some tricks, you can just lock valid cache lines into the cache. The cache controller thinks, well, these are valid. I have to keep them into the, ca in the cache. Well, pretend it's just RAM. It works. And everything after the 386 has cache. And, and it works on every x86 compatible chip. Uh, now, wh once we have RAM, we can use uh, a stack pointer. And we can do the call return instructions, fairly essential for compiled C. Uh, parameter passing on the stack, it, it's the x86 uh, 
ABI, as it's called, like uh, the binary interface for, for, to in for interfacing with C functions, requires passing parameters on the stack. There's no, no way to pass them in registers uh, normally. It's on some RISC machines, but not on the x86. So x86 requires stack, requires RAM to run C code. So once the cache is useful enough to, to work as a small RAM, um, we can run C code. And of course, then we are initializing the RAM. And each of those memory modules, uh, like the, this RAM block, has a SPD, Serial Presence Detect EEPROM. It's a very small serial ROM chip. It's, uh, it contains some parameters that describe what type of chip what size, what timing parameters is in this RAM module. And the first thing that the core boot needs to do is to find out what RAM modules are actually there. And then it has to use the South Bridge and the SM bus, the SM bus system management bus. It controls uh, fans heat centers, stuff like that, but also the, it provides access to those uh, SPD chips. It's a kind of I squared C bus. Uh, I think that's familiar to all embedded programmers. Uh, but the SM bus uh, provides access to the SPD chips. Unfortunately, every motherboard does it in a different way. Uh, so this is very hardware dependent. Now, once you know what RAM chips you have, you can configure that North Bridge or the internal DRAM controller inside the CPU. And and get those RAM chips initialized. And sometimes you have to do some timing calibration of those chips. Most North bridges do it automatically. You just uh, send a command to the, those chips. You, you set a bit and then it starts calibrating automatically. And once it's done, it says ready and, and you're done. But I've done on some s systems manual calibration loops, like uh, setting a timing parameter to different values and check whether RAM reads correctly back and then uh, find a range of parameters which reads correctly and then set the parameter to the middle of that range. Uh, that's the fun stuff. <coughs> um, well, when RAM is there, finally we can uh, load the, the other part of core boot, the RAM stage, into it. And um, <coughs> and this stage will initialize the PCI devices and all things that are not physically PCI devices, but have the same types of uh, configuration spaces, like the internal North and South bridge chips. Uh, and configure all the bridges so the PCI devices behind the PCI bridges are reachable. Uh, things like that. Uh, there's, there's something. It's not a trivial task. And then there's some, not all firmware in your system is probably core boot or open source. Uh, you may have a VGA card with its own ROM. You may have a SCSI card which requires special 
initialization via its option ROM network card. Uh, so there's an opportunity to run those option ROMs. You, you switch back to real mode and you just uh, uh, run those ROMs in real mode to, to get the hardware initialized. And once all that is done, um, finally you can start the payload and everybody's happy. Now, how is this ROM in the, uh, organized? It's organized like, say, a read-only file system, CBFS, core boot file system. Now, that's not a very fancy file system. It contains named objects with headers, and those headers have type information. What type of object is this? Those headers contain names, names with slashes, so full backslash RAM stage, but it's, in reality, it's, uh, it's not a subdirectory structure, but just a linear structure, but if you put slashes in, in those file names, they look like path names. <laughs> uh, this file system has, com those objects can be compressed. There's, there's a LZMA, decompressor inside uh, core boot. It's very compact. It's like five kilobytes of code. It's smaller than a gzip decompressor and it provides much better compression. Um, but you have to use the correct version of LZMA to compress your object, because if you use a slightly newer version of LZMA, then the formats are not compatible between the decompressor inside uh, core boot and, uh, and the more fancy compressor. The well, the other way around, it works better if you have to the standard LZMA binary, it will decompress all those uh, compatible payloads. Uh, now, what types of objects? You have the stages of core boot itself, you have the option ROMs, configure, con the payload, configuration files uh, that payloads may use. And you can add well, when, once you have a ROM image in a single file, you can still add objects to it with CBFS tool. Uh, but it's not, not a real file system. Uh, well, how is it coded, core boot? Almost completely in C, I, I told that already. Uh, almost uh, completely in 32-bit protected mode, linear addresses, uh, no fiddling with segments and offsets, uh, no near and far pointers. But there are some places where real mode is still used. There are 16 instructions or so at startup to, to get into protected mode. Uh, of course, if you run the, the option ROMs, those are written in 16-bit real mode. And CBIOS provides the legacy BIOS interface, so it has to run in real mode. And some tricks are played with GCC, so uh, in real, so even though uh, GCC only outputs 32-bit. Uh, I386 code, uh, you can still run this in real mode once you add some uh, uh, assembly direct directives to the GNU assembler. So every instruction gets prefixed. Uh, even in real mode, the CPU is capable of uh, r using 32-bit instructions. Uh, only the addresses are 
normally there are some tricks to work around that too, but normally they are restricted to uh, 16 bits offsets. Uh, well, and you have to prefix uh, the instructions with certain prefix bytes, but the assembler can do it. Uh, so most of large parts of C BIOS are compiled that way. Um, so, now on to the practical matters. Obtaining sources. Well, there's a website, www.coreboot.org. Uh, you can read uh, where, to, where the Git repository is, but obtaining sources uh, requires uh, Git. There's read-only Git access. You can Git pull your sources from the Coreboot repository. If you want to contribute back to the repository, you have to have an account, and then you just can't do git push. You have to submit your patches to uh, to the maintainers who review those patches. But uh, <coughs> well, read-only access is anonymous and is. Uh, well, you can just do it. Uh, once you get those uh, sources, you have to compile them. And, well, if you have a PC, it's already an x86 system. Uh, core boot is x86 code. Uh, but still, you're likely to require a cross-compiler. Uh, mainly because... Uh, Bing Utils, the core boot has some uh, clever mixing of 16-bit uh, and 32-bit code in a single object. Uh, some versions of Bing Utils grok it, others don't. So you're basically stuck with the ex exact correct versions of Bing Utils. Uh, that have been used with core boot, and then it all works. Uh, but your ordinary compiler that, that comes with your distribution probably has, an, has the wrong version of bin utils, and you're screwed. Um, but fortunately, there, there is a, a make x GCC target in the core boot build script, so then it, it's gets the, the sources and it's it's a lot of work for your CPU but a, not a lot of work for yourself to set up this cross tool chain. Uh, <coughs> now once you you can configure core boot like uh, with make menu config just like you did with uh, do with Linux kernel it's very familiar and and then you compile the payload separately or not if CBIOS and Philo are uh, already targets you can specify within the core boot configuration file but otherwise you have to compile it yourself separately well make core boot uh, add files to the image to the CBFS image to, to just extra ROM stages, uh, extra payloads, and then you have an image file, uh, coreboot.rom, this is a bi raw binary image file, uh, and if you're running QMU you can just use it as the bios.bin file for QMU, and Hopefully that will work. Uh, otherwise, there's some more work to do. And that's flashing this image into your BIOS chip. And now there's, there's, there's two, two issues with it. You, you have to find a way uh, to do it. And you have to find a way to recover if uh, something goes wrong, and 
there's a separate project on the core boot side, and that's Flash ROM. Flash ROM is a, a tool for uh, flashing uh, BIOS chips. Uh, well, tens of different chips, tens of different uh, motherboards are supported. It's, uh, it's a great program, and you don't need this uh, stupid DOS program, or uh, now it will be a Windows program, uh, to flash your chip. And you can just take your coreboot.rom, raw BIOS image, and uh, flash it into your BIOS chip. Now that's, that's easy enough. But then you did that, and your machine doesn't boot up. What now? And that will happen. Murphy's laws are universal. Um, something goes wrong, it will go wrong. Um, so, well, the first requirement, it, it's, well, practically a requirement is that you have a socketed BIOS chip, not one soldered into your motherboard. If you have a soldered BIOS chip, uh, are practically required to, to get some geek with really good soldering skills, solder this thing out of the motherboard, uh, put a socket in its place, so you ha can put the BIOS chip into a socket. It's, it's practically a requirement. And then you have that socket, but uh, you need to program the chip uh, when you can't boot your machine because your uh, chip is uh, corrupted. So you need another chip and, and you need a way to program it. So, so you need at least, well then you can buy uh, expensive prom programmer, big bucks, uh, hopefully it can program your chip. That's one option. Uh, those PROM programmers are expensive because they uh, need to have dozens of sockets for dozens of different chips. Uh, dozen, they have to be capable of putting uh, s many different voltages on all each pin of, of, of those sockets, like uh, a minus uh, 12 volts for some EEPROMs, uh, a plus uh, 7 volts for other EEPROMs, God knows what. Uh, but if you're, you have a sim only a single type of chip, you can home build or buy a simple programmer for just that chip family. And there are several that, that can program BIOS chips, some, some types of BIOS chips. Uh, you can build it yourself, you can buy it for a lot less money than a professional programmer. And most flash chips uh, are fairly easy to program if you don't want maximum speed. And then you don't require exotic voltages. <coughs> but there's another, there's another way, and you only need a second uh, BIOS chip. You, so, instead of buying one motherboard, you buy two, or, and the second one has the second BIOS chip, and suppose you programmed your BIOS chip with uh, wrongly, and now it doesn't boot up, uh, now that motherboard is bricked. You take the, the chip from the second motherboard, put it into the first motherboard, now the first motherboard boots up again. And uh, Now, once Linux is running, it doesn't need the BIOS chip anymore. Pull it out, uh, pull the corrupted chip in its place, run flash ROM with, uh, with the 
hopefully good uh, BIOS code and try again. Hot swapping is dangerous though. If you sh make a short uh, circuit in your socket, uh, you can ruin uh, your BIOS chip and God knows what on your motherboard. It's not a very good idea, but it has worked for some people. Uh, but there are less dangerous things to do basically the same thing, and that's uh, a, there's a, a kind of thing called BIOS Savior. It's basically a small circuit board that goes into your BIOS socket. Uh, it has two ROM sockets on, on that board and a switch to switch between them. Now, you can uh, boot your PC on the good BIOS chip uh, and then reprogram the other chip and uh, without losing your good BIOS chip. And that's, that's a tiny bit of extra hardware. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you can replace that BIOS chip with a ROM emulator, a, a big expensive machine or a slightly less big, less expensive machine that you, you build yourself if you're a hardware hacker uh, that emulates the signals of the ROM chip uh, and on the other side, you can just download uh, data into the RAM. And s most ROM emulators have things like breakpoints and, and things like that. So you can trace at least the uh, instruction fetches of core boot. Uh, once it executes from cache, you don't see those instruction fetches anymore. But it can be great debugging aid. <coughs> Now debugging. Debugging is hard of low-level code. And well, in the good old days of uh, ISA boards, uh, <laughs> you still had the you had those post codes. You could uh, insert a postcard into one of those slots. This thing was trivial to build yourself. You could buy it, but it was not say, in stock in the regular PC shop around the corner. Uh, and then you could see anything that was output to port 80 hex. Port, uh, you could see it on a, on a seven segment LED or just an array of eight LEDs. And that helped you trace the early stages of your code. Uh, well, slightly harder to set up is, uh, but of course we don't have the ISA bus anymore and there are PCI postcards, but they require more work to set up in the first place uh, and they're harder to get. Uh, and now we don't have PCI slots anymore, so PCI Express, so uh, serial output is a debugging aid. The, Serial port, if you have it, it's fairly easy to set up. It's, an, it's still an ISA device, sort of. Uh, the EHCI debug port, uh, most uh, the USB controllers in modern motherboards have some debug output port that's easy to set up, but the hardware to use that port you need hardware to, to, to plug into the, to your USB slot and, and, and do something useful with that port. That hardware is an Optanium. Uh, well, it's not in the regular PC shops. Uh, now, maybe debugging on a real board is not, not, not for you, so you can debug payloads and higher layers with under QMU. You can run AMD SIM now, that's a more low level PC simulator. It's not open source, it's free as in beer, but not as in freedom. And, but 
and, but it can run under 64-bit Linux. And, well, you can uh, get uh, some taste of what low-level hardware initialization is uh, on AMD systems. The ROM emulator, in-circuit emulator, if you're really lucky and your university has one. You don't wa buy, want to buy one yourself, I think. <coughs> um, now, development of core boot. Payload development is relatively easy. You can do it under a simulator. Uh, there's a library, libpayload. That, that's the, the kind of C library. It's, it doesn't have all functions of the standard C library, but some. You can do printf. Uh, you have c cursors uh, library inside. Uh, so you can do some fancy screen layout as well. Uh, now the, the usual things like malloc, strucopy, everything is in there. Uh, so you don't have to do it all on the bare metal. Uh, so payload development is relatively easy. Now porting to new hardware, that's, that's a lot more of a challenge. Uh, Every single motherboard has, uh, well, every single Northbridge, Southbridge combination needs different code uh, to set up. Uh, every motherboard has some twist to how it accesses it, uh, SM bus stuff. Uh, and debugging is hard. You uh, there's no, no easy simulator for, for your motherboard. Um, Resources, of course, the, the website www.corbu.org. I hope it's readable, it's not contrasting color. www.corbu.org. Uh, mailing lists, the Git repository, the related projects, FlashROM and uh, CBIOS. But now I still want to do some demonstration. Uh, because it's almost time. And <coughs> let's first do uh, uh, no keyboard focus. Grumble. Uh, make we are already in the core boot source directory. Core boot uh, menu config. So This is what you get with make menu config. Um, so you can do uh, mainboard selection. Now, what mainboard do we have selected? Uh, mainboard venue or vendor emulator, QMU, that's the, the thing we uh, selected. But you can select uh, many vendors. So but I will stay, stick with emulation. Uh, ROM size in, in QMU can be set to four megabytes. Uh, no, or very few boards have that much BIOS ROM, but at least it allows me to, to run a Linux uh, kernel as payload. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, all chipset things, generic drivers, console, whether you want a uh, VGA as a console device or uh, serial. Uh, the payload, you can select, uh, select the payload. C BIOS, Philo, uh, uh, any ELF payload, none. You have to add it manually later. Well, stick with C BIOS. Um, you can compress it with LZMA, like this. Uh, it's, there are lots of uh, configurations. You can add a VGA BIOS. Core Boot doesn't provide VGA BIOS. If you have a, an onboard VGA card, you uh, somehow have to extract its BIOS. Uh, and while there are no real, full functional, for realistic hardware, uh, 
open source VGA BIOSes. There are some for Cirrus Logic uh, VGA cards, uh, but but this hardware only exists in Cameo anymore. Uh, anymore, it's not on real devices. <laughs> in the museum, yes. Uh, <coughs> no. So so there's a lot to conf that you can configure. Now we can run make. It's already made mostly. So. And then you get this listing of the CBFS file system. And you see there is this PCI uh, thing, dot .rom th file, that's, that's the VGA BIOS, the QMU's VGA BIOS. Uh, there's the fallback RAM stage, uh, fallback coreboot.rom, that's the ROM stage. There's the payload, uh, f that's, that's, C bio uh, that's uh, C BIOS. Uh, you get a config file inside. Now this thing is, uh, I already made a symlink uh, from uh, coreboot.rom to bios.bin. So bios.bin is coreboot.rom. And so give this baby a test drive. Uh, and that's and then I uh, hope to, 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 yes, I pressed uh, F12 uh, on, on time. It's, it comes up with F12, press F12 to, to s for bo boot menu, otherwise it would start a CD-ROM. But on that other screen, that terminal screen, um, this thing put out, output lots of Diagnostics. It, it's it's really running core boot, not QMU's own C BIOS. Uh, and now we can uh, select two to start from the hard disk. Now that's Debian. Takes a bit of time to to, to start up, but. We're not demonstrating Debian, so I will shut down it uh, straight away. <coughs> so there's Debian. How nice. Uh, and then get to this shut down thingy, shut it down. Uh, And that it did. It has no ACPI support. Uh, you could. Uh, but now let's add some payload. Uh, so, which command is that? Uh, yeah. So now we add the the core boot payload. Do one, and then uh, now the Linux payload is added to the to the ROM. Uh, we could even demo it if it's it's really. Uh, and then there's a third option in the boot menu, and then. It starts Linux uh, uh, on the serial port. The, this uh, terminal window is doing the serial port of uh, QMU. And well, you have it. there you have it, a Linux inside uh, ROM. Um, are there any questions? Uh, well, yes, this, you. Uh, this ha these uh, hacks to, uh, to uh, run C 
code in uh, real mode. But as far as I know, it, uh, when you have real mode, it uh, has a segment limit of uh, 64 kilobytes. So you need to, to load new selectors to, uh, to get access to more than uh, the 64 kilobytes uh, on, uh, in real mode. Yes, that's true. Uh, well, uh, BIOS is meant to be to run in in real mode. You can switch if you're doing a really complex function. You can, can in theory switch between real and protected mode, but it adds extra overhead. Uh, and well, when you have very simple things to do in C. Uh, you can get by if if you only have a single function. Uh, this this uh, so most BIOS interrupt services are not that big, that com they are not that complex, and you can get by with uh, sixty four bit uh, kilobytes, uh, sixty four kilobytes codes and data segments for most jobs, and then you have some macros. C macro C functions to get any data from any address uh, so your disk write routine can well, it's almost like the the copy from user copy to user macros that are inside the Linux kernel to get to get the disk data from user space to kernel space it, it kind of works the same way in the in the BIOS calls uh, but it's not an ideal environment, but you uh, any more questions? I think there's only room for oh there's no room for questions. Uh, yeah, thank you.